Okay, today I am going to be visiting or revisiting another chat with uh, a friend and colleague. His name is Matthew Davidson, goes also occasionally by the name Stretta. We interviewed him some time ago, uh, back when he was working for Cycling 74. We talked about what he was doing there. We talked about his work with monomes. Since then, a lot has changed for Matthew. So uh, we'll start off by saying, first of all, hi, Matthew. How are you doing? Uh, I'm awesome. Hey, how many twofers have you actually had on the show? Uh, four or five. Wow. Well, there you go. Anyway, um, so let's start off by having you talk about uh, what you're doing now versus what you were doing back then. Back then, rewind. Um, well, okay, what I'm doing now is I'm now a full-time teacher at uh, Berkeley College of Music in Boston where I uh, did my undergrad. And um, I'm reminded of just what a great place it is, just walking, walking around the halls, going through the practice rooms. And every day I feel like it's um, such a privilege to be back at that place where there's this really great energy and... Um, people are doing amazing work. There's, it's really inspirational artistically, both as a, as a teacher and, and a musician. Um, so now that I'm, I'm teaching full time, I actually just wrapped up my first, um, I guess, two semesters, my fall, fall and uh, spring, as being a full time teacher. So um, I'm, I'm really super excited about this, and I, I feel like it's, it's been really good. That's really cool. What are the, what are the classes that you teach? I teach in the electronic production and design department, and when I went to Berkeley, uh, this department was known as the music synthesis department, and uh, the the department itself was founded probably almost like I, I hate to say thirty years ago by by Dave Mash, who is still at the college, um, and he he started the music synthesis department. And you know, looking back in the history of of the music synthesis department, it wasn't that old. You know, by the time that I actually, you know, started there in the late 80s. Um, and so electronic production design is, is kind of different from some of the other departments at Berkeley. It's within the uh, professional writing division, which there used to be this music technology division, which was music production engineering and music synthesis. And that all got kind of brought under the umbrella of professional writing. So the EPD department, as we call it uh, for short, uh, focuses on like solo electronic uh, production or, or electronic production that would involve like a producer and a vocalist or uh, purely electronic music and all sorts of um, music of that type of you know production style. Sure. Um, so when kids come to Berkeley to to take on the EPD stuff, what is it that you think is in their heads? Who do they want to be? They you see this changes, and this is part <laughs> of yeah. This is this is part of what uh, music technology is all about. Like um, curriculum for like uh, harmony or ear training or um, you know fields that don't change on a daily basis <laughs> or yearly basis or whatever. Um, so it's like what how I teach a class from semester to semester changes, um, and so what the students are coming in looking to be or wanting to be is also changing at a really rapid rapid pace. And so I I was teaching part time at Berkeley when I was uh, working full time at cycling, and so this is you know going back four years now, right. and you know what the students were coming in and interested in then um, is vastly different than what it is today. And, you know, I would, and so I, that's the, more than anything else, rather than saying, well, they want to come in and they want to be Flying Lotus. And we certainly have that. Um, it's, it's just, it's more accurate to say that you have to, it changes semester to semester and you really have to be on the pulse of, of what's happening. Now you cannot sit down and just let the music industry like go by. It's like going so quickly. So what do you do to keep up? I'm curious because it's, that's hard work. What I do is I listen to my students, and I and at the beginning of at the beginning of every semester, I take their temperature. I find out what what is cool, what they're actually listening to, um, what what they want to do, listening for the this the kind of words they're they're using, 
And it's just, it's amazing how, you know, the older you get, how, how rapidly it seems to be moving (laughs) in the younger cultures. How do you take the knowledge that you've developed over, you know, roughly a zillion years and how do you package that in a way that kind of is sensitive to this now factor? Um, it's hard and it's a challenge, um, but there are some underlying principles that can be applied universally. Um, and so I'm course coordinator for a few of the the core you know music synthesis classes within the the EPD um, curriculum now. And one of those early classes is the modular functions and signal flow. And you know, regardless of what happens with music technology, you know, within the space of a year, a VCA is still a VCA. And learning how to learning how to to trace the signal flow or understand the signal flow of some of these fundamental concepts um, still applies. You know, applied forty years forty years ago, and, and it still applies today. And so, instead of teach like the 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 synthesizer that that students are really asking about right the, these days right now that's really super hot is serum. Everyone everyone loves serum, mm-hmm. and um, but you know you look at serum and you break it down and you're like these are all understandable components that uh, we already teach, and um, so instead of teaching instead of teaching about a particular synthesizer you know before serum it was it was something else let's say it was massive people people use massive a lot. Uh, we can, if we're, t- if we're breaking it down to the fundamental concepts, uh, then they can apply it on, you know, whatever the next, you know, synthesizer that's going to be hot next year. Right. Now, one of the things that I heard of recently, maybe you told me, or maybe I just heard of it somewhere else, is that um, you are actually leading the charge to develop a modular synth prof- based performing group, right? Oh yeah, yeah. So in the in the fall, um we have um a new prototype course. We have a couple prototype courses coming up. And this this is like a general we want to enhance the performance aspect of our department. So the, the idea of electronic music performance. We we're we're creating like three different prototype courses to address this. And uh, one of those courses is a modular synthesis performance class ensemble. So it's going to we have in our labs that we teach uh, this modular function signal flow class. We have six identical Eurorack modular configurations, and so we can we can teach this instrument, and so we can have an ensemble uh, that all plays on on the same instrument. And so we're launching this prototype prototype course in the in the fall. And uh, I'm really I'm excited because I don't I don't know of any like college courses that are like, hey, we're going to get, you know, half a dozen people together and we're all going to play this, you know, our own individual but identical modular synthesizer. Right. Yeah, that sounds pretty unique. How how complex are these synths that that they're going to be using? Um, you're going to be using? Yeah, they're they're nine new you know, configurations and pedagogically they're they're outfit to teach the class. And um, we, you know, since this is kind of new territory uh, or a new type of technology that we're going to use to teach this class, um, I think that now several years into using the modulars, you know, our selection of modules can be refined a little bit. Um, so, for example, uh, in in each one of these modulars is a is a dot for a one fifty five one fifty four combination sequencer. And that's it's a lot of real estate to dedicate to a sequencer, but the reason um, we, reason we went with that is because they can be clocked at audio rate, and it's and it's kind of a, a a fun demonstration to show you know students how they can essentially draw waveforms in the time domain by using an analog sequencer, and right. uh, that was you know years ago when we when we put that together. Um, I think there's better, smaller options for sequencers, or even take the sequencer out and and fill it with some other things. One another th- another thing that I think would be a good modification to the modulars that we that we have is a way of of visualizing signals. Like, you know, I I would say let's get no tool, but you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, <Unobtainium. laughs> yeah, how to how to get one? I mean, right. Um, so, and that's actually visualizing signals which is a huge thing in the Eurorack world because essentially you have you have a, a, a mechanical standard like this is how big the the modules are going to be you have a power supply standard 
and you have somewhat of a, a signaling standard where everything's one volt per octave. Uh, but after that, you know, it's like there's no <laughs> there's no standardization, and then all the all the marks on the mo- on the all the legending on the panels is kind of arbitrary, uh, yeah. not you know module to module, manufacturer to manufacturer. And in essence, it means that if you're if you're coming in using your ears to get a sense of your gain staging is way more important, or it's it's way more important than uh, other types of models where you may have a better visual indication of of what your where your gain staging is like. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. Uh, recently, I put together a little uh, a little booklet that is kind of the beginning of some writings I'm going to do about modular synths. And the idea was it kind of showed how to patch up the four, you know, four of the canonical modular patches, right? Yeah. And it's great because you can show the signal flow and say, you know, here's where you would have a VCA or here's where you have a low-pass gate or whatever. But also these things have a tendency to be sensitive to uh, the settings of, like, envelope times or relative pitches or whatever and i realized you know i i had to talk in relative terms rather (laughs) than be able to show a picture because there is you know nine o'clock on the oscillator tuning knob means nothing yeah completely arbitrary completely arbitrary so how do you how do you teach given that is it is it because I mean, are all the modulars in the school the same? And is the expectation then that they can figure it out from there? Or do you really teach the ear training part of it? Well, I mean, all the modulars in the lab are the same. And and through experience, I know that, you know, if I drive this VCA with this particular envelope generator, then then anything past this arbitrary marking on the, on the front panel is going to start to overdrive. Um, but we're fortunate in that the modulars are, are one of at least two different ways that, that I teach any particular concept. Um, and what's nice about the modulars is that it's, it's hands-on and you, you're physically connecting the patch cables and it, it creates this collaborative environment in the classroom. Right. Um, but you can't, you can't hand in your modular for homework and you can't, <laughs> you, you, or an exam or whatever. And and so it, it necessitates that we that we use another environment or a software environment to uh, do these sorts of things. And in the software environment, then we can talk about um, actual. You know, we can talk about milliseconds, and we can right. talk about voltages in very precise terms. Uh, and and so being able, to, it's a teachable moment. I say it. You know, in addition to the ear training, um, we can relate it to to the software, which you can then hand in and and uh, do exams on and and so forth. Sure. Now, is this software the Beep software, or is yep. it something else? No, we're using we're using Beep uh, almost uh, for for the modular function signal flow. It's like we have this two you know sided approach. We'll do it on the modular, and then and then we generally just then turn it to Beep. I'll right. often then relate it to a commercial software synthesizer or will right. or will break down a commercial software synthesizer and then reconstruct it with beep modules oh, um, so we can make that so we can make that association and we try to find all the all the invisible modulation sources like where is keyboard tracking does it exist how can we <laughs> how can we you know d- you know reverse engineer this and and try to figure out where where this is in the, in the signal flow um, but yeah, beep is beep is a critical part to uh, in not just this class, but a, a few other classes, and it's it's really it's fun to to watch students use the environment, and it's turned out to be a pretty uh, robust um, system for us. Sure. Now, getting back to the uh, the modular ensemble, which is kind of fascinating to me. Um, Long ago, I was part of a, a small group that was a modular ensemble, but it ha- there were some limitations. First of all, it was everybody's personal system, so there was no there was no concept of like having a, having a standardized instrument. But beyond that, it was always at, at the very best. We we, <laughs> we would laughingly talk about doing comprovisation which is like a minimum of composition and a whole lot of um, improvisation over the top of it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it almost always tended towards the the range of music between experimental and just downright horrifying, <laughs> right? 
<laughs> what is your vision for this and how might you be able to... So, like, one of the things that's interesting to me is, like, the laptop orchestra concept, which is sort of was sort of like a precursor to this using where people use laptops and uh, kind of modularized software. It, people actually started to compose for laptop orchestras and they started bringing components to these laptop orchestras that would be used for performance and it was a really interesting expansion of what the laptop orchestra could be do you imagine something simpler similar for this modular ensemble yeah i it's i don't know yet um because i haven't the it's going to launch in the fall and we haven't done it i have no idea what is going to be successful and what is not going to be successful i but i have a lot you know a list of things i'm going to try Um, and and so one of the things that clearly i'm going to do is you know what how do we use the modulars in an improvisational context and uh, and part of that, a major component of that, from my experience with um, uh, improvising with modulars and modular ensembles in the past, is that uh, this is a great moment, especially in the EPD department, where we're going to teach um, how to listen to to your fellow you know improvisers, and then uh, also a sense of space uh, t- with your fellow improvisers, because uh, the default of a modular is just on, you know, it's, <laughs> right. it's like, hey, you want a drone? Here it goes. Um, so how, how are we going to control that drone aspect? How are we going to, to give the, the, your other performers the space in which to be heard? How are you going to restrain yourself from like filling the entire, you know, frequency spectrum, which is something that can be easily done. Um, right. Yeah. So, my, my friend Grant used to talk about this ensemble that we had and he was like, you know, one of the problems is that any one person can do all the noise. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, and I've certainly experienced that. Um, right. And so that's just, that's going to be one thing we're going to try. And, and I think it may be an important component. Um, so I, I do see a lot of improvisation. Um, but also I, I want to do some composed pieces. I want to, there's some arrangements that I, that I want to try. Um, I, there, there isn't going to be a, um, a ratings uh, prerequisite for this ensemble, um, so I don't, or I don't know what what uh, kind of keyboard players I'm going to be able to get access to immediately. Right. Um, and but maybe we try this again, and we and, and we get all right. So what happens if we get really amazing keyboard players? Or maybe that's a mistake. Um, <laughs> you know, I I don't know. I'm looking. I'm so looking forward to to trying this out. This is going to be the the pilot, and we'll we'll see where where it takes us. But uh, I definitely have a, a ton of ideas to try and, and uh, one semester to uh, sort of figure some of this stuff out. Yeah, well, that sounds really exciting and really fun. Now, I'm sure not only myself, but I'm sure like other educators who are curious about Berkeley wonder how, what kind of access you might have to other departments. So like you, you've got a group that's oriented towards Um, electronic music production or production and and designerly activities. There are going to be other departments that are focused on composition and yet other departments that are focused on performance virtuosity, right? Sure. To what Um, extent can you draw from those? Can you go to the composition organization and say, hey, you know, what's the chance we can get composers to work on this? Is can you do things like that formally, or is it all pretty informal? This well, this is something that the college is is trying to actively encourage. They they don't want these silos to be to be these impenetrable things, right. and they're active. You know, they're actually petitioning the departments and saying, "What can we do between you know, where where how can we facilitate more interdepartmental you know uh, communication and activities and projects?" Sure. So, like you know, film scoring and and the electronic production design. There's things going on, but we can do more. And you're you know getting the composition composition department involved is a, is a great uh, idea for you know this modular ensemble. It's fantastic. And um, there's we've just we're in the process of merging with Boston Conservatory, and and so we have this whole uh, Boston Conservatory music, dance, and theater. 
Um, and and so there's going to be oh, a, nice. incredible opportunities for collaboration between between this new college that that Berkeley is, is now merging with. So interesting. Um, is this is something that's really actively supported by the college. They want to see more of this. And so any sort of opportunities to have this type of cross-communication is going to be actively encouraged by the, by the uh, college. Sure. Now, how does, how does Berkeley feel or deal with or in any way encourage or maybe discourage things like working with visuals, whether it's something pre-cooked like Resolume or something you know that you build yourself using jitter or vvvv or something like that is is there a component of that or is that something that the students explore very much at all absolutely um especially we see that in the in the senior projects a lot of students are interested in uh, in creating visuals uh for music and um a, a great many of them a majority of them have max as either the central component or some type of glue component um, the, it, at the juries for this midterm, I noticed there was at least two different Max visual, you know, music visualizers that were that were proposed and and we, we saw work on. Um, and there's been projects. So there's students that do a lot of uh, work with visuals um, where Max is like generating OSC messages that are communicating with these other other software packages. Got it. Um, sure. And so this happens at concerts. It happens in senior presentations. And um, I, I can only imagine that this is going to be, we're going to see more and more of that, especially, especially in our department. That's, that's where you see most of that stuff happening. Right. Now, you are in the interesting position of being able to see some pretty bleeding edge stuff because sometimes students have, you know, the best students will take on that kind of thing. What are some of the things that you've seen recently that were really exciting to you? We're we're starting to see more like music that's outside of like I'm going to make a three song EP. Uh, and some of the best you know most exciting things I've seen are uh, student installation projects where they um, have some sort of conceptual idea and execute it. Um, I saw a, 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 one of my students actually had a um, a data visualization from uh, the MBTA data that I thought was was really interesting. Um, there's a lot of people actually are fascinated by the subway system. There's another student who was in, who used the acoustics of uh, various sub subway you know areas and designed a piece around that uh, or and an installation around that. There's an entire um, Neil Leonard at, at Berkeley is involved with this uh, interdisciplinary uh, group that is doing fascinating things. That it's just, there's just so many things that I can't even. Uh, keep track of all of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So one of the things that a lot of the things you're talking about r represent is an interaction between people, the instructors and students, students with each other, students across departments and all that stuff. But one of the things that Berkeley's doing now is promoting online and distance learning, right? Right. How does... How does the things you teach have to change when there's not people in a room? Well, I think that's interesting because you know Berkeley is is as you say uh, doing a lot of this long online learning, but at the same time, music is one of those inherently collaborative you know things, and and so on on one hand, I could see like higher education becoming more and more remote because the technology makes that possible, and there's certain subjects where it's a it's a good experience even mm -hmm. um, like my you know Khan Academy where well, you can teach so many things through Khan Academy and it's a system that actually works pretty well right. uh, there's kind of a before I decided to become a full-time teacher I thought well you know, I, I looked at this idea of online learning and and thought well is this how does this affect my job security how does this, <laughs> how is this going to affect the industry Right. And I came to the conclusion that um, Berkeley's doing what Berkeley does with online education and remote learning um, is a is a great way to augment what they do, but it certainly isn't a, an entire replacement for for everything that they do. So the you know, the classroom experience and and the what I would mention earlier about just like walking through the halls and feeling feeling the excitement that's that's in the physical space there. 
um, being inspired by the the people around you and and that exchange of ideas and that energy is not really replaceable by by an online form, at least not with the technology we currently have. Right. Do you imagine the full Berkeley course set being able to be online, or is it always going to be just sort of a portion of the teaching? I well, ensembles. How how do you yeah, <laughs> how do you do an ensemble online? Right. Um, the performance aspect. How do you you know? It's uh, that's that's pretty hard to to duplicate. I mean, I, I guess you could imagine like some type of private lessons to be to take place over Skype or some type of conferencing system like that. Mm -hmm. There's just so much of the of the experience of physically being there. Um, I I don't think it's possible to replicate the entire you know catalog. But there are things that you can do reasonably well. Uh, and and so embracing embracing online learning like they they're doing is a good thing, but I don't think it's the complete picture. Right, right. Working out of Boston must be really kind of uh, a unique opportunity too, because Boston is home to some amazing uh, homes of higher education, right? And so realistically, they're sort of like. Berkeley is kind of considered best in class in this kind of this this type of music and music technology education. You've got, you know, MIT, which puts out amazing technologists. You have Harvard, which puts out amazing lawyers, I guess, or you know, politicians. But I mean, you're surrounded by you know this kind of like super embrace of education. Do you feel like that makes? Does that in any way? color people's experience or change the experience of learning or make it better or make it more vital or make it more diluted? I don't know. I'm curious about Boston as a place to learn. It, it certainly creates more opportunities. And um, so, for example, um, there may be really cool stuff happening at MIT, which is just, you know, over the, over the bridge. And there's certain, certainly been um, like we did a we did an analog heaven at um, at the MIT Media Lab, and you know just walking amongst these people who who were like MIT Media Labs who were curious what we were doing there at Analog Heaven um, created interesting opportunities for me to make you know new acquaintances and friends and and look at their research and get a chance to tour the robotics lab and. Um, or the, or even something not even high, not even like education related, but you have a place like um, the the Nerd Center, you know, the Microsoft <laughs> the, yeah. the thing, and and so uh, we did like we had uh, Rolly there, and like the music hackathons, and uh, it's there's like so many opportunities. It's it's really it's like a question of like what are we gonna do this weekend? Uh, there's there's so many things that we can take advantage of, and then also for Berkeley. Um, there's a lot of places to there. There has to be places to play. So right. it mean, meaning like uh, we're gonna we're planning a new conference in the spring, and it's going. You know, we have this electronic music component. You, you know, sometimes you you know you don't want to play certain kinds of music in the Berkeley Performance Center. You want to play it in a club. Right. Right. And so you need those places uh, that are local and, and easy to get to. And you need a transportation system and everything's pretty, you know, compact here. I, when I, when I, I ride my bike to Berkeley and, and so when I ride my bike, I, I ride past Harvard and I ride past MIT and I, then I, then I'm at Berkeley. It's, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, that <laughs> I, we have this ability and it's all concentrated in this one little area. So I'd say, you know, more, uh, you know, opportunity riches are are available in this area sure now <clears throat> talking about technology made me made me want to ask uh go down a different path now a little bit um to me you're one of the rare people that you know really has a, a strong embrace of both technologies and musical ability i mean i've heard your music it's gorgeous um, I know your technology work. It's fantastic. It used to be that that combination was extraordinarily rare. It seems like that's less rare. Would you agree with that? I, I really don't have a sense of where things were coming, the way things were when, when I was at Berkeley. Um, I, am, I am seeing, you know, people who, well... I interview people to get into the major. It's a capped major because we have, um, 
you know, a certain number of lab stations, and so we can only run we can only run the, we can't like grow the the classes in a in a really you know rubbery way. way right. Yeah, so they so they have to be so they have to be capped. So we have to interview people who want to who want to get into our major, and so. Um, you know, every semester, you know, we have we get a new crop of students who are interviewing to to get into the major, and I get a chance to to look at their portfolios and get a sense of who these students are and um, what their backgrounds are, and what I'm seeing is um, a lot of people who to get you know to get into Berkeley you have to you know have a certain bar of musicianship, and so the students that I'm that I'm interviewing for the EPD program are already pretty good musicians. I mean, they're they're Actually, you know, stunningly good. The quality of musicians are, are are really good. They are they want to produce music, and their music may be actually produced pretty well. But the the level of technological knowledge that they have is usually in a in a place where it like makes sense for them to apply to the program. In other words, like we have something to teach them. Right. Uh, which I, I mean, I don't want to, you know, it would be terrible to, to be interviewing a student that's like, well, you actually could be teaching all these courses. And I'm not, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not actually, I'm not finding that. Um, and so I'm finding, you know, good opportunities where I can, I can start with a musician who has vision and talent and drive and then give them the technological tr tools that they can apply to their art. Sure. That's interesting because there's this tendency to imagine that you know, there's this horde of kids in their mom's basement that are becoming technical monsters, right? And, I mean, maybe that's the case and they're just not applying to Berkeley. I don't well, know. <laughs> what, what, I'm, what I'm seeing is the main thing that's happening right now is a lot of kids are, are educating themselves on YouTube. And so they are, they're learning, they're learning a, a, a way, a, a path to technology that is, that is really very surface level. And so the YouTube right. videos, they say, turn this knob, press this button, or use this preset. I don't know what the preset does, but it really makes everything sound good. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so when I hear their projects, it's like there's a surface level gloss to it that didn't exist 10 right, years ago. Right. But but the technical the actual technical knowledge what they the knowledge of what they're doing actually isn't there. So now, if you could take one of these students and sort of like hit the rewind button about four years, and set them up with a path to take that would put them in a in a good position to succeed, what would it look like? You know, what would it, what would you say? Here's the four here's the four years to spend before you come to Berkeley. I don't think that advice has actually changed, um, and that is just do stuff, just make things, and the more things you make, the next thing you make will be better. Um, some people kind of maybe run out of things to make, <laughs> um, but it, it's I don't know. It's that drive to to continually you know refine your skills and the the constant curiosity or the constant you know. How can I learn about this? How can I learn about that? And just keep keep working on it, over and over again. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna use a <laughs> I'm gonna use a martial arts anal analogy. <laughs> um, so I've been spending a lot of time doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and when you when you are practicing with someone, or as they say, when you're rolling with someone, it, it you know ends in a submission or um, you tapping. And you could kind of you kind of look at that as like a video game. It's like oh you died, and uh, so then you you, know, you rewind and you go back again and you go through it again, and in the course of an evening you may you may die you know like twenty five times, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's it's this willingness to drop your ego, and go back and like okay so I've learned from that and go, keep going back again and again and again and again and again. And those are the people that are successful. Mm, very interesting. So how do, I mean, in this age where a lot of us can crawl in mom's basement and do a pile of work, where do you find, you know, prior to, prior to going to Berkeley or going to wherever one would decide to go, where do you find people, where do you find the mechanism of critique that yeah. allows you to get that kind of 
thicker skin and it's, or a stronger soul? That's 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 a great question, um, and, that, and that's because I think that's something that um, higher education provides. That's something certainly something that we do at Berkeley. And it's really, it's a commodity that is in very short supply. And it's not because there are, it's not due to like talking to qualified people. Um, there's a lot of people who can give like, you know, bad advice. There's a lot of people that can crush your ambition and like, um, and, but you don't necessarily need someone who is a musical expert. What you, and this is something that we talked about inside of cycling was, is just the art of facilitating objectivity. You need someone with a set of fresh ear, ears who can notice things, you know, for the first time. Because as a as a composer working on a piece of music, you you don't get to hear your music for a first time ever. Right. Uh, and so, just if, if random people on the internet like aren't very good at this, uh, or <laughs> you know, or they provide the the worst, or they provide the opposite kind of motivation where it's it's like you they say something and you want to quit because. Right. Yeah. You know, they right because it because it hurts and it's not it's not constructive. Um, so it, that is it's you you nailed something really hard. So when you're working away in the basement and you don't have anybody who can give you honest but not dis, you know destructive criticism, um, it's it's so incredibly hard and difficult. But again, you you don't I don't think you need to be a music expert. You just need to be someone who's good at at giving that kind of that kind of feedback and that in its in and of itself is rare well for yourself when you were learning who what was the critique mechanism that helped you um i didn't have one i mean there was uh, it was nice just to be able to drag notes on a on a page and hear it back and that was that was the feedback mechanism um now everybody can do that um, mm -hmm. But when I when I was doing that, that was kind of novel, and that was a lot better than what we had before, which was not anything. Right. Um, and you know, the music that I was making in high school um, is you know complete garbage compared to the music that that people are making in high school today. Um, and that's a you know, there's a number of factors that are contributing to that. But the bar is always you know getting raised a little bit higher and a little bit higher. I really, I don't really think I had a, a good feedback mechanism. It was just like, you know, keep doing stuff and using the internal critique to, to try to improve or finding some other mode of inspiration. I didn't think we were going to go down this conversational path, but it's very interesting to me because that is something, in a way, there's been an opportunity for musicianship and production and songwriting and all these things to be much more widely dispersed and maybe much more social than it used to be. But I'm not sure that we've necessarily built up the kind of mechanisms that allows that sociability to provide valid feedback. Yeah, that's why I say um, a lot of the, the feedback that you're getting these days yeah. Is destructive right. because um, with you know the few few exceptions, um, most of the the places where you provide the feedback, you have you you're allowed to say anything because you, you know it's you're either largely anonymous or you're certainly not physically in the same place with that person, and that, right. that colors how the the feedback is. Sure. And also, it's it tends to be you know very um, surface oriented like you know oh great bass or you know i, yeah. I don't know it, it's just it's not really useful feedback and sometimes it's just it's it's destructive feedback right right so at uh when kids come to berkeley and they're presented with i mean how do you walk them into the critique process i mean it can't it obviously can't be like you know booting them into the deep pit right you must, there must be mechanisms by which you kind of slow roll them into getting used to that kind of critique or not. I don't know. What is, what's the answer? The classes you have to, in the classes I teach, you have to have a, you have to have a very uh, clear grading rubric, um, like how I'm going, because otherwise it's just arbitrary and like it, it gets down to like, Oh, I liked your, I liked your work or I didn't like your work. Mm -hmm. and it has, so it has to be, you meet these, you meet these criteria and that way, it's very—it's a defensible way of grading. 
that's why we have that's why we have rules in counterpoint it's like we want to teach composition and so if you follow the rules then we can we can grade your composition right. and if you break the rules oh that's a that's a mistake you you know right. it's, it's like it's like math at that point mm -hmm. um, and so when it comes to offering feedback um, you usually you this is going to be happening in like the the senior level classes where we have these um, Pro, you know, uh, seminars and uh, project-oriented things, um, and then we use class critique where everyone is is listening to the the piece in progress and they offer their advice. But before the students get to that point, and and I think in the classes that that lead to those those senior level classes, we need to have more critiquing. The students need to have more opportunities where they can talk one on one with the professor. Mm -hmm. And so my the students when they when they're in their you know the second and third year, um, they're they're always making music and I encourage them to come into my office hours and bring their bring the piece of music that they're working on so I can listen to it and, and tell and tell them you know what's going on. And and so more and more, I'm finding my students are taking advantage of that because it's office hours. You know, it's good to take care of the the business of the classroom, but I want to. I, it's also nice to have them making this connection early on and giving them the feedback. This isn't something that we have to do. This isn't something that we're told to do. But I think uh, I I find it's actually having a really positive uh, impact on on the students that I have contact with. Cool. Well, we've already completely run out of time, and I just like have like 90 more questions I'd like to ask about the process of teaching that you go through and stuff. But Part three. Part three, yes, we'll plan on that already. But um, one last thing. Um, we talked already about, about people learning to do lots of work, but in order to prepare for a series of study at Berkeley, what do you think are some of the most important elements that a potential student can have? Do you think it's important for them to have spent a lot of time with individual teachers? Do you think that it's useful for them to take classroom studies in other kinds of uh, schools? What do you think are some of the things that can really help as precursor work prior to coming to Berkeley? That's a good question. Um, I really, the students that I, I really am the most fascinated by are the ones who who really have something to say and they're not it's it's not like well you know I'm kind of interested in music technology so I decided to apply to the EPD department that's it, it, it's it sounds like you know I didn't have anything better to do and so <laughs> I, no it's, but I, but to get the one to sure. get the ones that are like burning you right. know you know and you can see it and they're they're like you know I want to they they have an artistic goal in mind and they're just looking for help to achieve it they're going to find a way to do it you know and you just want to help them you want you know my advice or like what i what i like to see is like figure out what you want to say figure out what you what you want to be i mean it's i don't expect people to be fully formed <laughs> when they when right. they come in but i mean they should they there should be this desire there should be this burning there should be this willingness to, to explore and learn and like this curiosity is the is the main you know things that, I, that I'm really looking for if you don't if you don't really if you're not seeing that within yourself then you know maybe find <laughs> maybe look time for some self-examination yeah, exa exactly yeah. exactly time time to, to it shouldn't be like well I don't you know it, it it really should be like I have something to say. And I'm looking for looking for some help to express myself, um, and having that huge you know desire to do so. That's that's the thing that I'm I'm really think think is the most important thing. Sure, excellent advice, and I think that that's probably good advice regardless of what kind of art the person is trying to pursue. So that's fabulous, uh, fabulous advice. Well, Matthew, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to talk with us. And, uh, and I look forward to hearing what you do with this modular ensemble. It sounds like a really exciting set of developments. And uh, so hopefully you'll keep, uh, keep in touch with us and let's, let us know what's going on there. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Darwin. Absolutely. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Greetings from Minnesota. Thanks so much for listening again. Thanks for sharing this as well. We're getting great listenership. 
I'm in the process of doing my preliminary moves, so I'm going to be a little scramble-headed for the next couple of weeks, but I do have a couple of good uh, people lined up, so I'm really looking forward to it, and I will catch you next time around. Thanks. Bye.